And then Deanna will make sure that I hear the, the questions as they come through and we'll do everything we can to answer them. We've left about 15 minutes extra time in this, in this um, time slot. So if we run over, well, we may run over. I'm not tied into one hour. Um, I think Zoom will tie us into one hour, 15 minutes. I'm glad you're here. It's, it's so thrilling to see 38 people here to hear what I have to say. I hope I, hope I, can, I can have enough to share that it's interesting. So thank you very much. Um, I guess we'll get into it. So here we go. I'm muting you all. Sorry. <laughs> I love you, but <laughs> Okay, Deanna, can you hear me? Oh, I cannot hear you. How about now? Now I can, yes. Okay. Deanna, I'm moving so there's not such an echo, um, so it won't be com confusing for both of us. So okay. Go ahead and I will move quietly. And I see some people that didn't get muted. I'm going to go through and I don't want to be the guy that leans into the camera, but I'm going to be that guy. And suddenly my computer says the battery's dead and I know it's plugged in. So the cord's falling out. There we go. We'll make this work. Thank you for all your patience. All right, so here we go. Um, I'm going to pull up my phone. I've got some really simple slides just to kind of um, let you know where we are. I am not kind of guy that's gonna give you slides and read them to you. So don't worry about that. But I want you to be able to know um, where we're going and what's, what's happening. All right, so welcome to the introduction to Nature Journaling. So the, we're at the workshops of G.B. Davis. I'm Jeff Davis, the G.B. and Jeff and G.B. Davis. And I um, run a teaching studio in Noblesville, Indiana. We're on the north side of Indianapolis. And it's so exciting to have people here from all over the country and the world. I teach wood carving. I open the shop to teach luthery. I teach people how to build ukuleles. I teach ukulele playing. Um, I teach wood carving, decorative painting. Um, and then most recently, I opened my um, letterpress studio. I did letterpress years ago. I had a letterpress shop probably 15 years ago and um, haven't had time for it. So I reopened that, we brought presses in and that's where I am now. And that shop was supposed to open on April 1st. That didn't happen. And I've been print, doing a lot of printing and kind of sitting on my hands. So I was really excited. And when Nickel Plate Arts, the Da Vinci Pursuit um, asked me to teach this, this nature journaling class. This was a class that was ongoing before um, we had the lockdown. And it's nice to be able to get this going again. So <clears throat> I taught school for 33 years. So there's gonna be method in my madness, I hope. So I've got a, a basic class format that I'm gonna follow every time so you know what to expect. So there are no surprises and um, you can kind of learn where to dive in. I guess I should talk a little bit um, about my teaching philosophy and that is you are as much the instructor or more the instructor than I am. I'm the facilitator. And I know that's a cliche, but I honestly believe that you have more information about nature journaling than I do. And that my job is to kind of call that out of you, to pull that out of you so that we can, we can get that discussion going. And in order for that discussion to happen, you've got to use the chat feature and, and speak up so we know what's going on. So please do that. I think your, your information is more important than mine. That's the bottom line. So, um, I guess, first of all, go ahead and let me know where you are. Um, go ahead and on your chat feature, let me know where you are so that we can get a sense of, of that. I think it's really interesting, folks from all over.
Fantastic. I didn't know how to open the chat on when, as, as the minister. I've done this as a student, so it took me a second. Fantastic. Indianapolis, Noblesville, Granger, Sheridan, Fishers. And I know there's some people, I know I have a friend on here that's in Maine. I have another friend in Colorado right now. There's West Lafayette. Brown County, fantastic. Well, welcome. I hope sometime you get a chance to visit the shop firsthand. It's a, I think it's a pretty special place. Um, so just, I, I guess I've told you about me. I've asked you about you. Um, Deanna upstairs. Deanna, can you just spend a second and share with them what you do? Hi, I'm Deanna Leonard and I um, own Caravan Classes Studio and we're as art studio down in downtown Noblesville and um, we do lots of teaching and events and customized events. If you um, have a project that you want to learn with a group of people, we specialize in designing that for your group. So, oh, New Zealand. New Zealand definitely wins. Oh, good. I'm glad they got here. Fantastic. Um, so Deanna is, is my landlord. When I retired from teaching two years ago, I was really looking for um, studio space in Noblesville and she stepped up and said you can rent space in our basement and it's been really a fantastic relationship because she's a friend and a colleague and that's fantastic. Okay, we're taking a minute letting a couple people in. I'm going to mute everybody and then unmute Deanna. Okay, so we're Okay, just a second. Oop, there we go. All right, Deanna's live again. All right. So this is like, well, we've done that. So the next question is, in, in well, my statement here is a nature journal is anything that you want it to be. The question, what is a nature journal? A nature journal can be anything. So I, I'm, we're going to do a little activity on Instagram to talk about and show um, what I mean by that. So I'm going to go to Instagram. And I'm going to, I pulled up nature journaling, hashtag nature journaling. And I suggest you do this because you'll get dozens and dozens of examples every day. And they're absolutely fantastic. And there are people that I've, I've learned to follow. And, but generally, I just follow the hashtag. And you can see these beautiful journals. There's some great books. We're going to talk about books later. The Kingfisher. But I want you to, I, there's one observation I make about almost all of these that I wonder if you can make the same observation. What strikes you about these nature journals, it's a leading question and I, that's hard to do when I can't look you in the eye and, and talk to you about it. But there's something about these that has struck me and it really, it took me a few weeks to figure out what that was. And I guess we'll just drill down and show you that. So I wanna show you a page that I did. This is, let me go back to. Okay, so this is a page. That I did um, for this class and on this is from a canoe trip I took last Friday. And the, the, my canoe is called a canoe named Joe. So that's on the top. And then I listed all the birds that I observed. And most of those were from bird calls. Uh, very little direct observation. Um, I noted the place, the date, the time, noon, 70 degrees. It was a beautiful day. Um, I said review recordings for missing birds because I recorded this. Some of you might have watched it. It was a long trip. 17 minute recording of bird song. Um, and then I painted a picture of a mussel that I saw and I got pictures of that. And I talked about the environment the mussel is in. I've got some questions. What species is this? What age? 
And then um, somebody responded on an Indiana Nature Facebook, told me it was um, a fat bucket. I'm not going to try to read the Greek. I'll butcher it. And then I went and learned that it's parasitic to fish in the larval stage. They attach to fish and that they mimic minnows. Their mantle flutters in the water. It looks just like a minnow. And the fish come up to eat that and then they, they deposit the larva on the, on the fish. Then I was at home at eight o'clock and I heard a white, a white throated sparrow, which is one of my favorite birds. So I made a notation of that. So this is not the most perfect, wonderful put together page, but this is something much like what you'd see on Instagram, right? And then I, but this is the, the prep I did to produce this. And if you want, you want to see the real journal page from that trip? This is my journal. This is a leather bound journal. Here's an advertisement. I can teach you to make this journal here in the shop. This is, I've carried this for years. It's wrapped in leather and it, carry, it holds a moleskin. This is the page for that same trip. This is what I did in the field. This is what I did in the studio the next day. This is horrible without sound. I still want to hear reactions. But I think my point is that if you look at, let me switch back. Switching to the phone takes a moment. Amazon popped up. We don't want to see that. Denise says they're like finished paintings and Laura says we are ooing and aahing over the leather bound journal. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, the, and the journal's nice because it, it's durable. I can take this places. It gets wet. It's not waterproof, but I can take it places. So thank you. And I think anybody wants to build one, we'll help you. It's not, we'll, that's what I do. So yes, these paintings, these are finished paintings. I don't think for a minute that mostly, and I'm not saying everyone, because I know artists that go out in the field and do this, but I don't think most artists go out in the field and come back with paintings or drawings or journal entries of this quality. I think, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. What I want to make clear is that I don't think, every, a lot of people, let me back up. People come to me and say, I don't draw, I'm not an artist, can I nature journal? And my answer to that, of course, is yes. And part of what holds people back is these gorgeous, these gorgeous paintings, these gorgeous drawings. And that's not, I don't think that's nature journaling at the front end. I think that's nature journaling at the back end. I think that's what artists are doing in the studio with the material they collect in the field. Not everybody. And we're gonna talk about somebody in a few minutes that I know goes out in the field and paints like this, but I don't think anybody needs to accept, expect this to be what they do. So let's get rid of that. So Jeff Warren yeah. is saying, my struggle is I feel intimidated with the IG journals because I rarely make it past the chicken scratches on my page. Well, and, okay, so we'll flip through. My, well, I don't know if I want to flip through. The, let me flip through. Let's flip through this journal. Jamie will like this one. This is the journal from my Northern Forest Canoe Trail trip. <clears throat> I had a grant from the Lilly Foundation to paddle the Northern Forest Canoe Trail for Old Forge, New York to Fort Kent, Maine. I didn't get the whole trip in. I got to Rangeley, Maine, 450 miles alone in, in a canoe. It was before Moxie. I can't even claim I had a dog. This is the journal that I carried. And if you look at it, you see a lot of drawing. And this was a grant about going out in the woods and drawing birds. Do you see a lot of drawings? Most of it is narrative and that's okay. You can go out and write poems in your nature journal, can't you? I do want to point out one I just passed because this is what I want to get to. And this is what nature journals to me are about. It's a hey Jeff, we can't see it. We can't see the oh I'm sorry. I wonder why not. It's still on phone view. Okay. 
Thank you. I'm sorry. This is where I'm learning. Can you see it now? There we go. Yep. That's okay. good. So let me flip through this again, and you'll see that there's absolutely. Um, where are we eating up time? We're gonna. I'm oh, sorry. Um, we're learning, right? There, there's very little. This was a grant that I had to go draw and document the birds I saw, and it's mostly lists and narrative. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but it's not what I thought I was going to do. I like architecture too. And that's the other thing I want to say is I'm not a nature journaler. I'm a journaler. My journals are full of everything that I that I like. And if you've only known me for 20 minutes, you know that my my interests are eclectic as heck. I, I range from sign painting to architecture to to mussels. So these are mostly bird lists. But I do want to, one of the things that I think is most important about nature journals isn't how you journal, it's the why and the what. And this picture down here really tells, to me, tells a lot. So I was paddling and I noticed all these cedar trees that were beautiful. This is an old forge. These are people's summer, this is the Adirondacks. These are wealthy people's summer cottages and I had just started. I didn't know much yet. And all these trees were beautifully pruned on the bottom, even out over the water. And I couldn't figure out just things how anybody was doing that or why they were doing it. And then, you know, of course, over a few days, you start, you're thinking about this, and I'm doing nothing with paddling, so thinking is what I'm doing. And I realized this was a clip line from a deer. In the winter, the lakes are frozen, they eat cedars. So this line, this perfectly line parallel to the water, eight feet above the ice, rings all the Adirondacks and most of New England, and it's caused by deer. So this was the learning that came, this is where a journal comes into its own. It's from the learning that you do, the questions you ask, and then that get, puts, it, puts these issues in your mind, and then you start thinking about them and answering them. Isaiah okay. would like to know how long you have been journaling. Oh, that's a really good question. So, probably seriously journaling. I know I remember journaling with my kids when they were little. So, 25 years, 30 years. I have drawers and drawers of them. And people, when we can come back to the shop, you're welcome to dig through the drawers and look at them for what they're worth. Some good, some bad. But, you know, trying to get a hotel room at the end of my trip. That's in my journal. Lots of narrative. So the other thing I want to talk about is, well, let's, let's put this up here. If you're a printer, you have the coolest note cards in the world, right? Um, so these are some of the things that can be in your narrative. And as a teacher, I was trying to think towards higher levels of thinking. So you can start with a narrative or op just writing down what's going on as it's going on. Um, reflection, stop at the end of the day or a week later or after some time has passed and writing about what you've been doing and what's happened. Lists, I love to make lists. Bird lists, I make a bird list every time I go out. Um, observations, just writing down what you see or it, it doesn't have to be writing. I mean, that's the thing. It can be drawing, writing, diagramming. Um, collecting data, temperature, time of day, count the birds. If you ever go out to Goose Pond and you see a flock of snow geese or um, a flock of pelicans, counting is an important thing to do. Um, diagrams, drawings, and this all encompasses drawings. Asking questions, I think that's probably one of the most important things we do. Whether you write them down or they're in your head, I think your journal should be reflecting the questions that you're asking. And then the inferences you make, the guesses, the, the scientific, the, the hypothesis that you develop about these questions, and then drawing conclusions looking at that, those inferences and those questions and deciding or, or, ma or making those jumps of learning. And then of course, then you go back home, you go to the studio and you pull out your piles of field guides and then you start answering those questions. I've got somebody else coming in, just one moment. All right, we're back. Um, so then I go back to the field guides, and, I, and I'm, I'm a bird guy, but I'm also a fish guy, and now I'm a mussel guy, and I do like, I like plants too. Um, I taught science for quite a few years of my career. So anyway, then you go back to the field guides and you answer those questions, or you develop better questions or more questions. The other thing I wanna really make clear, 
and I can do this in the journal I'm working on right now, is I like to work frontwards and backwards. So this was done in Beaufort, North Carolina. I went there for a decoy carving show, and I spent a day canoeing, collected shells on the beach, and this is what I drew in the room that night. I didn't do this in the field. I did it in my hotel room, my Airbnb room, with references. So that's why this looks like it does. By drawing in a field, it wouldn't look like that. These are more that actually, this is me trying to push, because I knew I was going to be teaching a nature journaling class at that time. So I was trying to do more drawing in the field. So this is Worthington, Ohio. This is the day after Christmas. I was waiting for my wife and daughter to shop. And this is in Beaufort when I made that trip to Beaufort. Another one in Beaufort. And then there's one, this is the one that's where I really sat down. I laid down on the sand and I drew this prickly pear. But I don't do that. That's not natural for me. And when I first started teaching nature drilling, I was apologetic about it, but I'm not anymore. You gather the data that you want to in the field. It could be a list. We have a list of birds here. It could be a picture of a prickly pine or prickly pear. Um, another list. You can gather samples and put them right in your book. That was pressed in there and I glued it in later. There's certain things you don't want to collect. I think you all understand that. Um, but then you come back and do the hard work, the research, the drawing, and the, the journaling, the pretty stuff. You do that in the studio. And if you don't even get to the pretty stuff, what you've done is still important. It's still important stuff. All right, let's get back to moving, moving on. I'm going to move back to my phone. It will take a moment. Jeff, were you able to see where everyone was from? Yes, I did. And I'm going to go through that carefully later. Okay. That's pretty amazing. Okay, so now I'm going to, in every lesson, I'm going to make a, I'm going to send you out to read a book. I don't expect you to buy this book. I don't expect you to read it. But these are, these are the books that are really the backbone of what nature drawing or nature journaling is right now. And there is a movement. And I'm not part of that movement. I'm not journaling any differently um, than I always have. I'm not making pure nature journals. I'm going to still have journals that are full of, um, full of my art and my plans and lettering and hotel rooms if I need to. But this book by John Muir Laws is amazing. Um, his first book was about drawing birds. He's an amazing bird artist. And um, it changed the way I draw. And we're going to talk about birds next week. And then he came out with this book about nature drawing in general, in general and then about journaling. And actually, just last week, he came out with a book about teaching nature journaling, and I've not had a chance to do much more than flip through that because I was planning this class. But um, I will spend some time with that. Look at John Muir Law's book if you can find it. It's worth buying. This, you know, a lot of times you see a book for $20, $30, you think, is that really worth it? His books are worth it, every one of them. Um, seek out his videos. Seek out, he has a YouTube, lots of YouTube videos. He's um, got a great web page. Um, he's not a dynamic speaker. Um, Patty, who's watching, she's in this class. She watched a bunch of his videos and she agreed. He's not really a lot of fun to listen to, but holy cow, he's, he, he's got it. And he'll teach you how to draw birds and, and nature. Jeff, Kim is wondering if you have a separate journal for the finished um, after work that you do. That's a great question. And I don't, I just, <laughs> I have big, messy journals. Um, I could, so I'm a wood carver, so, you know, the finished work isn't in here. I do some drawing too, but this, oh, I don't have, let me switch the camera. So this is a piece, this is a commission I had last week. And I went back to some of my older journals and a lot of my photographs of my earlier work to see how I'd done a redheaded woodpecker before. And then I finally, I went to Peterson's page 257. Um, I love Peterson's. We could all have a talk about which, which guide is the best. Peterson invented field guide, modern field guides. Um, so I, I, I have a lot of respect for that. So actually I drew in my stylized manner, 
I drew from this picture. I also drew or knew, I don't know if I drew from, but I knew that I'd had experience with red, red-headed woodpeckers, especially as a kid in my yard. So I was thinking about that. And then I know I looked at previous work I'd done in my style. And so this is as finished as it's going to get um, for a three-dimensional. This is, that may not be entirely true though. Lewis is telling us that his book about teaching nature journaling is available as a free PDF download. Oh, is it really? I saw that today and I didn't believe it. So that's fantastic. Um, I had a client proposal laying around here somewhere and I don't see it. And it wasn't part of this lesson I was gonna throw up here, but I will take a picture like this. If, if I'm working with a client that needs to approve artwork, I will do this on a separate sheet. Um, sometimes in my journal and then I'll scan it, send it to them or on a separate sheet. They never get the original, I always scan it and send it. But it'll be exactly like this, but cleaned up a lot more. Uh, there wouldn't be scratched out lines. I wouldn't be using the abbreviations, but this is pretty much finished work before we go to carving. All right, back to. There it is, I lost Zoom for a minute. It likes to hide, doesn't it? All right, so I also am gonna give you a website every week. And um, this week, I'm just gonna tell you to go to, to um, Nature Journaling on Instagram because that's what I showed you. And you could, that's a rabbit hole. You could spend hours looking at those nature journals. But I want you to realize those are finished work in the most case. They're not, they're not really field journals. Or they don't, they don't have to be. No one has to go out there and produce that kind of work and say they're journaling. You can do, there are no rules. A nature journal is what you want it to be. And then you can also follow me at GB Davis Folk Art on Instagram if you're interested. I'm certainly not pushing that. But I do talk about my classes and show my work every day. So that's something you might want to do. All right, materials. I promise we will draw more in other classes. Okay, back to the camera. All right, so my favorite thing to draw in is a moleskin. And moleskins were um, traditionally, they've been around since, I don't know, turn of the last century. They have a nice durable brown cover, sewn signatures, really nice paper. This is typical of my journals. The last half is empty because I lose them and I start another one and then I don't go back to that one. Or sometimes I will and then I'll start three years later in the back. I'm not telling you how to do it right, I'm just telling you how I do it. Um, so I, I, I like these, I like, and I'm a traditionalist. I like anything that's old and been around for a long time. That's a moleskin in a larger size. They come in a tiny size. I often carry one in my pocket. So this is the medium and the large. In the print shop, we can even put things on them um, that are fun and interesting. So if you, when the print shop's back open, if you want a nature journal and want to put a turkey or a, dozen, a rabbit, whatever you, you want, you can put that on your journal. You can even put titles on them if you wanted to. Um, so these are my favorite journals, but I spent a lot of time in these. I used to buy them at Walmart. I hate to admit I ever shopped there. But you know, when I was young and had kids, that's what you did. And this is a really early one, 11-7, I don't know what year, but look how yellow that paper is. Jeff, Susie wants to know if you make these. Um, if I make these journals? No, I don't. I'm capable of it. And now that I'm doing a book arts program again, we might. So a quick commercial for that. And then I Isaiah wants to know, what moleskin binding do you like? Soft cover or hard cover? Oh, I like soft. Um, they go in my leather, um, my leather portfolio. They, they, you can roll them up. You can fold them over. Um, I don't like, I, I used hard journals, but I never liked them in the field. They're not good to put in a backpack or sometimes I'll, even these big ones will sit, fit in these, or these medium ones will fit in a jeans pocket. And I'm not, I don't baby them. They, 
they get wet, they get in my pockets. So hard doesn't work. So I'm going to do a book arts class starting in a few weeks. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I, you'll hear plenty about it. But these pamphlets, this pamphlet style book, really makes a great pocket journal. And that's something that you could make very cheaply, very easily over and over again. Um, this is another one that's a pamphlet style and carry that just about anywhere. The other structure here that I think would make a great nature journal, but probably more in the studio than in the field is an accordion book because you can, this book opens up into several pages and you could, I could see a canoe trip on there, a vacation in the car, um, a hike, well, page after page after page. You could really tell a linear story in a really wonderful way. So that class is coming up. That's going to start in a couple of weeks. I'm announcing this weekend the when and how's about that. So spiral notebooks. I'm left-handed, so I have a problem with these spirals. They dig into my wrist, but I also write sideways. You're going to see some of that. So that's not always a problem. You probably noticed in my journal, my writing is every direction because I do write sideways. I draw sideways. In fact, I turn the paper while I draw. So um, orientation is not always terribly important. And so I found this today, this, this snowy owl. Well, here comes Moxie with her squeaky toy. Um, I found this today and I can't wait to print that. That's something I've been looking for for years. And that's another reason I have journals. You can go back and find these things. All right, materials. So that's the journals. Here's my box. Now, I don't carry this every time. And there are things that I add to it. I'm going to talk to you next week about paints. But this is my basic box. I carry it in a bag. which I'll show you early, net later. I don't want to switch cameras back and forth right now. Um, but I have a bag. So let, I just want to go through some basic things. Hey, Moxie. She's bringing me her toy. Um, pencil. If I were just, if I carry a journal or a pencil and a fine point permanent marker, I am, I'm set. That is absolutely, those are the essentials. They don't have to be your essentials. You could draw with a ballpoint pen if you want to. I use Ticonderoga pencils exclusively. I think if you use them, you know, they're not what they used to be, but still some of the best. I see people smiling. Thank you. Um, these don't have the name on them there. I think the names have worn off my pens. There's one. So this is uh, Stadler Tri Plus Fine Liner, which is a um, permanent marker with a super fine line. They work really well. And then a Sharpie pen, Sharpie fine point pens are a close second. I carry these often too if I can't find the Stadlers. So I carry that in a pencil. And to me, that, this, that in a journal is enough. But there is more. I love Prismacolor pencils. So. But I do want to suggest a couple other things. Let's see. I thought I saw I, my hand lens is back there somewhere, but I don't know. So I like to carry a ruler, and um, I think it's important to draw that when you draw that you indicate scale, and a ruler is one way to do that. Probably the best way to do it. And these little six inch rulers have centimeters on one side and inches on the other. And I have two extras. So if anybody wants, I think I bought six for $3. I know they're really cheap. Anybody wants one of these, come see me. I'll give you one. Can you come see me? However, we can do that. The first two people ask for them, I'll get one to you. And then um, I love Prismacolor color pencils. And we're going to talk about those later. In fact, um, I think. I have a slide that says, yeah, we'll get to that. Never mind. So um, we'll talk about Prismacolors in a little bit. I'm going to show you how I use them. And I carry a palette that I've develop, developed over the years. But I have to be honest, Moxie, we love her. But um, I have to be honest, I started with a palette that was suggested by John Mayer Laws in his um, bird drawing book. And then I adapt it from there. The one thing that makes, that I really like about Prismacolors is um, the blender. Because you can take color, two or three colors, lay them on top of each other, and blend them in ways that 
that are difficult to do with paints. I, I really like watercolors. We're going to talk about watercolor next week, but you'd have to wait for one layer to draw before you laid another color on top of it. And with colored pencils, you can do this really quickly. Um, I do a lot of hatching and cross hatching, and they work really nicely for that. And you can blend colors really quickly. So if I'm going to be doing anything in color in the field, it's going to be with Prismacolor um, color pencils. So that going back to this, that is how that's how that's done. Except Jeff, I, I asked my group what some of their favorite utensils are for writing, and um, Susie commented, "Precise V five extra fine." Okay. <laughs> and who makes that? We'll go on. Um, Pilot. Yeah. Pilot. Okay. Yeah, I, actually, that's probably the one I started with. I used a Pilot Fine Point for years. I love it. Thank you, Susie. Nice. Um, we'll talk about these later. Oh, and then I have a pencil sharpener. And again, I like old things, cigar boxes, and this nice Panama tin. So I keep that in there to catch my shavings, of course, out in the field. Not a big deal to leave a little bit of cedar in the sand. but So that's my standard kit. I carry that in a messenger bag over my shoulder. Um, the journal fits in the back pocket of the messenger bag. So that works out really well. Any questions about materials? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Tab agrees with you on the pencils. <laughs> he better. Uh, Mark is saying he made a roll cloth for his stuff with oh, tie nice. on a sewing machine and it works great. That's fantastic. And I've thought about doing that with leather, but leather bulks up pretty quickly. Okay, I'm trying to switch back. Yeah. Excuse my noises. <laughs> All right, so we're going to draw finally. And my point of this lesson is that you don't have to be able to draw well or draw at all to nature journal. This is not, it's not an art contest. It's a way to develop questions and answers, document your experiences, and learn from what you've done. I think I'm going to have to take that again, Moxie. So... Drawing on camera, this is exciting. This is where it gets weird, because I could do this in front of people and feel great about it. So I'm gonna go back to the example from when I was in Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, I went back to Beaufort. I went to Beaufort for a carving show the 1st of December and liked it so much that I took my wife back there for New Year's and we went shelling and came back with piles of shells. And these are clam shells that are typical on the beach and actually some amazing shells, but this is what you find everywhere. And this is a really great thing to show your journaling because it fits on the page. So my, I'm gonna stress that if you're not comfortable drawing or you're worried about drawing um, and worried about scale, draw small. I know when I started drawing, I was much more comfortable drawing, drawing small. So I like to find things, or I, I suggest you find things that fit on your paper. So I, I've dropped this shell on here, and I'm gonna just go across it, keep my pencil vertically, and you get a wonderful outline, don't you? Now you gotta kind of look like a mirror because it's flipped, but there's a lip here. So I'm gonna draw the inside, I guess. I was going to the outside at the beginning. While you're drawing sea life, um, Tina wants to know what kind of bag you carry everything in, um, something waterproof? No, it is not. Um, on my long canoe trips, I actually have a waterproof sleeve that my journals slip into. Um, for daily journaling, it's just an over-the-shoulder, old, beat-up L.L. Bean uh, messenger bag. And I will, I'll, I'll show it. Well, actually, let me probably get out of this camera. There. <laughs> that doesn't show much, does it? Um, it's just a tired, over-the-shoulder bag. It's got pocket on the front. 
pocket in the back. And then there I drop my camera. And then it's got this wonderful flat place in the back where I can, I can um, put the journal. Journal slides in the back. It doesn't do much for keeping it dry though. So on canoe trips, I do put it in a, in a dry bag. So I always start with pencil and I start loose and then I tighten things up. And Suki asks or says that's almost like cheating, tracing the shell. Well, it's not cheating, and that's and I understand where she's coming from because I taught school for years and I heard art teachers and kids tell each other that tracing is cheating. But have you ever read books about how Norman Norman Rockwell drew? He he would pose everybody like they're gonna be in the paintings, he'd take photographs, he'd project them on his canvas. This is artists have been doing this for years. This is not cheating. And by doing this, you'll become better at drawing because you're gonna have a better sense of the relationships of these sizes and, and the way things fit together. Deanna and I had a talk yesterday about if once we get this outline in, this shell, if I were holding it, up, I don't know, over my shoulder, it would be really hard to figure out how to draw that. But if I could put it right there, there I have the outline. Now I can really relate to where these things go. I know that this stripe comes right out of this here and it comes, I don't know, you can even measure it. I have friends that would. My decoy carving friends would get out a ruler and measure how far back this stripe was from this nub, and they would mark that. And they'd mark it in a couple places, and they'd come through. But you, this gives you a, a sense of relationship to draw these other details in. I'm not trying to draw well right now, and I apologize for that, but we don't want to wait for that either. Um, but by dropping in that outline, you suddenly have a roadmap for how to do more of the drawing. I grab some other things. So here are, those are off the red maple tree that my wife bought me for my birthday, I don't know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. It's a huge tree now. Leaves a mess all over our cars. And um, I was pulling, I pulled these out of the gutter behind my truck when I parked this afternoon. Marilyn wants to know if you ever press leaves in your journal. Absolutely. Um, so this, I'm going to do a less, I'm going to do some lessons that aren't part of the class that you can watch during the week. And one of them is going to be about leaf structures, composite leaves and simple leaves. <clears throat> because if you understand the science and the nomenclature, drawing gets easier too. There's reasons for this. We're gonna do a flower dissection too, so you understand what's inside of a flower. Um, but yeah, I gathered this um, to talk about later in the week, and I actually put this in my um, book press, so it had a lot of force on it, and it's wonderfully translucent. I didn't have, board, it stuck out of the boards a bit. Oops, stuck out of the boards a bit, so it's got different texture inside now. But that would be something wonderful to put in a journal. And if we flip back, this is, um, a fern that I collected in, excuse me, North Carolina, and I just put it in with a piece of paper. It was tape, but I made it. It's just paper and, and glue stick. So often I have glue stick in that kit too. I pulled it out for a printing project to do things like, just to glue things like this in. So things like these seeds, maple seeds, we could trace those. And then we can even pose questions like, you know, what is what is this 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 reddish ugly thing or this out here and, and I think a lot of you know those are maple flowers but a lot of people don't know maples flower they flowered a week or two ago they're now in seed and so we've got these stems from the flowers with the withered flower heads but the seeds there too so there's some really interesting things that you could document just from a handful of those Mark tells us he often will use a pair of dividers to get dimensions from things yes. that he can't pick up as well as um, for enlarging something. Absolutely, and that's what my decoy friends all do, and I do it too when I'm carving birds. You can measure the length, the end of the bill to the eye and things like that, and mathematically proportion it. Um, it's really the only way to get it absolutely as accurate as, as it needs to be. So that's a fantastic tip, so thank you. And there are a lot of other ways to do that. And then Laura wants to know how you keep delicate things like that fern from just falling apart after a while. I'm not very careful. <laughs> I, um, 
my journaling is not to last forever. My journaling is ongoing and I had a frond fall off of this the other day. I don't, I just don't sweat it. it. Most of it will be there. This came, this was glued down. It came off. I noticed that today. Um, I may go back and reglue it, but I'm not careful. I don't worry about things being archival. I don't worry about being permanent. This is really about my being, it's really about me being in the moment. The furniture I designed for this print studio. So I don't have a good answer for that. I used to use glycerin envelopes and I was thinking today I might go back to that. I don't know. I, I think their yeah. contact paper works really well. I've seen a lot of people oh, press sure. things even um, like as a window. And when we were kids, we used to iron them things between wax paper. It'd still be done, couldn't it? So I wanted to, the other thing is the, to in order to make difficult things easier to draw. This is a lilac that I cut from the backyard. Hope Julie wasn't looking out the window. No, she doesn't care. Um, and this is a really complex flower. There's flower after flower after flower. So if that is more than you want to deal with, you can really dive down. Let's just look at one, one lilac flower. And if you look at that, I think anybody here could draw that, I hope. That's not, a, that's not an editorial, you don't feel like you can. But it's just, it's a cross. I would draw a cross first to register that. Get that holes in there. Get those four petals in there. And in the field, that's enough. And then if you have your pencils with you, I can see there's a little light there. It's, it's a little bit of light around the mouth of that flower. And then you could do the, the violet on the rest of it. But the point is to take things that are complex and draw the parts that are simple. And then stylize them. There's, there are no rules that it has to look. We're not drawing scientific um, illustrations for journals here. We're, we're learning. We're documenting our own experiences. So this is a stylized iris that I drew. This isn't what an iris looks like. I drew it from an iris, but I simplified it. I took things out that I didn't like. I simplified it. Um, I did a painting. There are a couple paintings. Um, one's on the window of the shop upstairs with stylized hollyhocks. And this is where I was going from real hollyhocks. I used photographs because this was about a month ago. And I was looking at how they bud at the top. And as you go further down the stem, the flowers are more mature. You get the bottom and they're completely mature. And then you get below that, they're withered. And so I started drawing these very stylized hollyhocks. And they ended up in a painting that I found up in the front window. I did two of them. I actually sold one. Denise Marshall suggests making a journal out of um, envelope sections to hold all the stuff. Abs that's a great idea. So when we, I talk about things like these, 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 these books that I make and these journals I make. Now I have, I, I taught bookbinding at IUPUI and I was really into this for a long time, but it's been 10, 15 years since I've done it. But yeah, I used to make, I used to sew like glycerin envelopes into these pages or you'd sew a smaller journal in here for subtext or you'd sew folders into this or envelopes. Um, I've got well, I thought I had it hand, but I've got those little tiny coin envelopes, thousands of those. You could sew those into signatures and drop specimens in those. That's a really good idea. Fantastic. All right, the other thing I want to talk about is, and we're kind of well, I'm not worried about time. The wood poppies in my wife's wife's nature garden. So these colored pencils, and the tile, I'm not going to go back to it now, but the title I made for this was not your, not your junior high colored pencils. And I'm sure a lot of you have used Pris Prismacolor. And again, I'm not going to make an effort here to be artistic and do this accurately. I just want to demonstrate the pencil. So I'm looking at this and we've got kind of this rusty color here. And I'm going to, again, not accurately, but I'm going to do something to simulate that, to give us a sense of that. So I'm 
mostly I meant to just go in one direction, hatch that like that. And then I'm going to come over it with a little bit of red. And that's hatched further apart because I don't think we need as much red. We already have some orange. I can add a little of that. I'm going to add that a little higher up. And then this is where the magic comes in. And if you read John Mayer Laws about how to use colored pencils, or you read some of the advanced colored pencil books, they talk about colored pencils as painting. There's no distinction between paint, fine, fine art and painting and colored pencils. So if you take this, this is just a stick of the binder without any pigment, and you make little circles over it, you get this really nice blend. And if you really work at it with some, some intentionality that I am not right now, you can get a really nice transition of color, and you can get colors pretty much right where you want them. That one needs to be a bit, I don't know. I'm not gonna fuss over it much. I'll fuss over it a little. We'll put a little bit just of that brown on top. The other nice thing about these markers or these colored pencils is they come in a million colors. You don't need them all, but they, they have them. And then you can actually take this and follow those lines that were in the shell. And get a sense of what that shell looked like. So I, this is my this is my go-to kit, and this is the way I would attack this this kind of this kind of task of, of looking at these shells in the field and, and painting and coloring them. So we're, we've got about four minutes. I'm happy to go longer if you've got questions or comments, and please feel free to. I, I'm not in any hurry, but I am running out of <laughs> what I want to talk about. Um, I do want to challenge you over the next week or so to, um, to draw, to find things in your world, your garden or in the field. I love seeing people draw, thank you. I see heads down, people are drawing, thank you. Um, I challenge you to go out and find things in the field, leaves, um, shells, nuts, small things that you can draw at exact scale. Next week, we're also gonna talk about what do you think needs to be on a page? Are there things that are essential, things that aren't? Of course, there are no rules. But within that, what, what kind of things do you think need to be on a page? And, um, okay, I see people asking about the pencils. Yes, <laughs> go longer. I could talk all night, Joni. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. Um, <clears throat> I got a guitar behind me. We'll play. Um, so, you, but my, your task is to go out and draw something, make a page. I don't care whether it's formal or informal, and share it on our Facebook page. And we do have a Facebook page. I set it up for us, and it's where I will be sharing some lessons during the week that aren't part of the class. I will be sharing some prompts, already have some examples. And I want you to upload your work, a picture of your work on there, so that we can see it and talk about it. If you're not comfortable with that, of course, don't. I'm not pressuring you, but do that. And if you do, I have a giveaway next week for people, somebody that does that. We're gonna put all your names in a uh, your names in a hat and we will we will see who who wins who wins the prize. Okay, Miles wants to know if you have any tips about how to outline object, object objects you can't trace like a feather. <laughs> who cares what Miles? I'm kidding. Miles was my apprentice. I love him to death, and he and I have not seen each other in a very long time. So I'm glad he's here. Um, you could trace a feather, Miles. Um, we'll, yeah, we will talk more about that. I think my personal trip through, through art was to start small and work your way up. So I think if you start drawing on small things, you will start to, um, you, you'll start to get more confidence to be able to draw larger things. And that's not much of an answer right now, but, um, in practice and everybody here that draws would agree with me. Just draw and draw and draw and draw. And when it doesn't look good, don't worry about it. Draw it again. And don't be afraid to draw it again. You don't fail, you're practicing. I have, and I, I'm sure flipping through there, you've seen X's through things. There's some little duck in here and I hate it. Um, I don't scratch it out. I don't cut it out. I don't get the page out of there. I just, there, that's a little silly duck. Um, it was supposed to look like the re a real duck, not a cute duck. Um, don't be ashamed of what you come up with. Keep practicing. 
um, fail and practice and fail. Any artist will tell you that failure is part of the process. I failed today. And um, you just do it again and you do it again and you do it again until it's right. And things get more complicated. Oh, Baltimore Orioles out the window right now. That is fantastic. Deanna, you have Baltimore Orioles too, don't you? We do, yes. You're both lucky. First year I had them, which is fun. Oh, that's great. Your pictures were wonderful. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm about done. The only other thing I want to do, and, and you know, this is what I feel, I don't feel like I have to, but I feel like I should, is again, tell you who, your, who the sponsors were because they've been most generous. You know, right now, I'm not doing a lot of the work. Some of my ukulele students are here and they know my, my bread and butter gig was teaching ukulele and I've not been doing that. And I'm doing okay, I'm not suffering, I'm not running out of money. Um, but it was so nice to have a job come through and be paid so well for it and to not be able to, and, and I asked them if they sponsored me if I could not charge you. And they were good with that. They paying me well for you to do this for free and it couldn't make me happier to see 40 some people here today. So thank you. I hope you got something out of this. If you did, let me know. If you didn't, let me know. I'd love to have feedback. It's my first Zoom class. It looks like this is what I'll be doing for a while. So um, help me out. I'd appreciate any of the feedback. Well, shall we turn the mics back on? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Let's see if Jeff can figure and out how to do that. I think Friendship. this has been fantastic. I think you gave us a really great base on where to start, and where to go from here. And I think everybody was saying the same kind of the same things that I am. The it kind of it was very intimidating. Like, what do you draw? How do you draw it? I don't draw so well. Where do you go? So, I think that you gave a lot of great instruction on where to start and where to go Good. from here. You don't have to be able to draw. You have to be able to think. No, <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I am trying to, have to see where to unmute people. Where, somebody that knows what, what to do. Oh, I know why. Because I am on my desktop. We have 38 people here right now. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, you are all unmuted. So if anybody else. <laughs> you may speak. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Well, I Thank you, Jeff. Tell you how tickled I am to see all of you. Friends, people I don't know. People from as far away as New Zealand, Oklahoma, and Maine. This makes me happy. Thanks, Jeff. It was good. That's great. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, it was great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, we'll have more next Thank week. Thank you. So draw for me, turn in your homework, and you get a prize. Oh, boy. Doing my homework. <laughs> feel free Thank to email. you. Talk to me on Saturday. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye, Max. There she is. Bam. <laughs> There's, There's Jamie a bunch again. Of zoomers on here. Look at all these backgrounds. I know. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Hey, I don't know. Patty, are you really out by some water somewhere? No, no. That's my standard picture from Central Park. <laughs> yeah, it looks good to me. Yeah. I try to walk it quite a bit. Jeff, I've got a question for you. Hello, Laura. It's nice to see you. Hi. I just blocked myself. What's a good source for learning bird calls? You've got so many bird calls out, birds out in our backyard, but it's so hard to identify them. I mean, do you use like Cornell? Did you use Cornell University's website, or how do you learn bird I calls? I do. And yeah. let me, I'll, I'll find, let me see the app still on here. And I do you use Merlin? I, I, Merlin didn't exist when I learned these. Um, Cornell's good. Cornell's bird, good. Bird song. It's called bird song. Bird song. Yeah. Bird song LV. It'll listen, it'll listen to the call and identify it. Or well, the one I I learned from actually quizzed you. It would play you like bird after bird after bird, and you'd have to identify them to get points. Oh my! It, well, this is fun though. It was a little intense, but yeah, it was fun. Don't do it outside though, because I did it once, and the oven birds came out of nowhere. <laughs> I was up here. What was the 
what was that app called? Birdsong. Um, song, bird song. And the one on my phone says Birdsong LD. Okay. Yeah. Great, thanks. And it'll change your world. When, when you start to hear them and know what they are without thinking about it, you know, you've, it just opens your eyes to so much. I don't know. So Lisa, I've got more type for you. Um, I'm ready. I appreciate it. I'll see you Monday, won't I? I wish they would. I hope I'm doing it correctly. You're fine. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from uh, the other side of the world. I'm so glad you made it. What time is it tomorrow there? Uh, of course it's tomorrow. We're always there oh, first. I thought so. <laughs> what time we're in the future. I'm talking to you from the future. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm so glad you can do that. I'm glad there is a tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, folks. I guess it's time. Yep.